Good evening, everybody. So I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves kind of straight down the line. Um, so my name is Jenny Totten. As Deborah said, I'm both a faculty member and a member of the Appalachia program team for Future Generations University. And my own resume is itself a story of kind of rambling and wandering of a rambling and wandering soul who was enamored by mathematics and physics, rural communities, and gently nudging others into their own greatness. Uh, these days, I spend a lot of time in the grants and program development world where I get to take data for analysis and combine it with the ground truth of storytelling to create both community and university level outcomes and impacts, which is really exciting, particularly around youth programming, economic development in Appalachia, and agroforestry work, including both non-timber forest products and tree syrups. And so that's kind of my tie-in with all of this. Uh, simply put, I transform research data into stories. And I get to support communities through relationship building with people all over Appalachia. Um, and so I'll start with Dr. Hufford. She's first on my screen below me. So take it away. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Mary Hufford, Associate Director of the Livelihoods Knowledge Exchange Network, known by the acronym of LICAN. And uh, I direct LICAN's Stories of Place program. Um, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you. I'm a folklorist by training and have for the past 40 years worked with Central Appalachian communities as a folk life specialist, first as a folk life specialist with the Library of Congress, and then um, through academic positions at Virginia Tech, Ohio State, and the University of Pennsylvania. My focus has always been on how communities steward forests and waterways, celebrating community life through storytelling, festive events, arts and crafts, music and food ways, and more in ways that transform distinctly Appalachian settings into enduring places. O Pioneer beautifully exemplifies the ongoing process of transformation um, uh, that I'm talking about. And uh, I want to thank Clara and Jonathan for the film and Deborah Sosower and Future Generations for inviting me to view the film and to participate on this evening's panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Hufford. Uh, Clara, you are next, so I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Dr. Hufford. Hi, everybody. My name is Clara Lehman. I am the director, and then I also did some writing and producing on this film, so wear many hats when it's independent film. Um, I know you know this game in your communities as well. Uh, it, it's, it translates to film as well that you have to, it, it's raised and created by a community that cares a lot. And this was a labor of love for me and Jonathan. Um, I'm also the founder and director of Coat of Arms, which is a creative studio, and it's located here in Helvetia, West, West Virginia. I grew up in the community of Helvetia and my passion for community development and uh, foodways and folklore and and um, things like that has been ingrained in me since I was a child. I think growing up in a brigadoon of sorts where nothing changes, but everything changes is um, kind of what I love about Helvetia and about the state of West Virginia. And so um, this film was really meant to be a love letter to the state uh, in, a, in a way to create some healing that I hope that we can, you know, take with us as we move forward and try to create better paths for our future generations, as the name suggests in your university. Thank you so much, Clara. Jonathan, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you. I so often have the luck of going after Clara, who is such a wonderful partner and well-spoken artist and communicator um, that I often get the chance to just say like, ditto, you know, like she she sets things up so so wonderfully. Um, I will say, so I'm, I'm Jonathan Lecoq. Uh, I was born in Chicago, uh, where I lived until about uh, four and a half years of age and moved to Oak Park, Illinois, which is a suburb just west of the city line. Um, had a lovely upbringing there with my parents. My Cuban mother and Belgian father instilled many multicultural, uh, you know, sort of ideas and um, wanted to make sure I was a well-rounded young boy. And so did many, you know, community development uh, volunteering efforts that my mother was often involved in, was often found behind stage during my father's like blues gigs and just sort of like soaking in a very 
eclectic sort of uh, tapestry of experiences. So I feel very lucky to have uh, started there and uh, went to Carleton College. And that's where I, I met Clara and uh, was very lucky to do so and uh, followed her ultimately to her hometown of Helvetia, West Virginia, where we live now, operate our business coat of arms and, and raise our two children, Lucy and Sophia. They're 10 and go to the small school there, which is Pickens. So um, I feel very lucky to be here with all of you and appreciate the opportunity to share this film that means so much to us. And, uh, you know, like so many artists, we have big goals and 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 things change as you create and produce. And, and I'm encouraged by uh, the sharing of this work with with all of you. And hopefully it, it connected with with all of you in some small way. Thank you so much. All right. So to get our discussion started, I have a few questions that I've the panelists have been sent. So they've gotten to prepare at least a little bit in advance. And then everybody in the audience, if you want to put questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom or wait until we can elevate folks off of panelists to, or into being a panelist, then you can either wait for your questions or put them in. I will read them out loud. Um, I have six questions. I'm sure we will not get to all of them. And for the panelists, I'm a super laid back facilitator. So if you guys play off of one another, that's fantastic. If we need me to facilitate more, I can also do that. So um, I want to start with Dr. Hufford uh, in particular. Uh, you are the person, the panelist who uh, was not involved in the making of the film. And so we just want to get your your like preliminary reactions. So what were your initial thoughts as you got to view the film kind of for the first time? Sure. <laughs> well, as I watched it, um, uh, thinking about the series contextualizing this as an Appalachian film, I found myself wondering, okay, what is particularly Appalachian about the experiences it portrays? Um, I find many threads that connect it to a broader Appalachian history, but again, these are, but these are not always explicit beyond the opening preamble that cites the centuries-old history of exploitation and the national media's appetite for stories of Appalachian despair, which I point well made and very well taken. Um, so all of the arts featured in the film have connections to uh, what's grown to be an almost taken for granted canon of Appalachian traditional arts. Um, the fabric arts of Nellie Rose resonate with a long history of quilting, spinning, dyeing, weaving, and sewing. I mean, the, the region, there are so many great sewers in the region. Uh, blacksmithing like that of Tim Hibbs continues to be a staple at regional festivals, while metalsmithing and machine work are vibrant skills that tend not to be celebrated so much as folk arts, um, which I think is an oversight. <laughs> uh, but the real, the real issue here is... Uh, Okay, wait, 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 okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, then there are the, the well-recognized verbal arts, including the art of preaching, as well as of storytelling, which we see abundantly with the portrait of James Morley, as well as poetry and songwriting and musical performance. The music is famous for its musical traditions. Um, I was very interested to see then that this film actually makes no distinction between art and folk art. And I think that's a real strength. I really like that. And knowing now that Clara grew up in Helvetia, I think, you know, I, I wonder, I wonder that whether you gave that some thought. Um, uh, that's folklorist Henry Glassie once quipped, "It's either all art or it's all folk art." Uh, I was intrigued. Um, there, there, so there's that that little tension which we could bookmark, um, and then um, I was intrigued by a couple of other interesting tensions. There's what strikes me as a curious tension with the trope of the pioneer. Um, we see that every one of the artists honors those who came before them, parents, grandparents, and the artists who taught them. Um, and there's there's also a tension between, you know, I mean, the idea of the pioneer is somebody who's striking out where no, no one's ever, I mean, we know. Uh, okay. Um, uh, there's also a tension between the notion of the solitary pioneer and the vibrancy of community life that finds expression through the arts. I mean, arts arts uh, can be a real sign that, yes, there's community life here going on. Um, even even the work of a solo, very, a solo artist. Um, so compensating for the experience of exile from 
community life during the pandemic, the arts uh, showcased in the film actually helped to rekindle the community life that was put on hold by the pandemic. That's how I, that's what I, I saw happening. And I, I really uh, was intrigued and, appre and appreciative of that. Um, and uh, yeah, that, 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 this experience of exile was likened to the experience of being exile, being uh, in outer space. Um, so there's also a lot in the film about how we make meaning from the residue of our lives and the lives of others close to us. From James Morley's cereal bowl that ties him to the grandmother he never met, to Nellie Rose's use of her grandmother's safety pin to hold her dress together. Um, I liked how the filmmakers seemed to have found multi-layered ways to amplify the meanings they wanted to convey. Um, uh, for example, I found in the film some startling resonant resonances with the theme of pioneering. Um, James Morley talked about how not being able to see where we're going all the time is a characteristic of the pioneer experience. And it also seemed to me that marrying his husband, James Hibbs, was also an act of pioneering. Uh, and I'm wondering whether the uh, filmmakers hoped viewers would pick up on that um, as such. And I wondered whether there were other kinds of pioneering that you hoped would resonate with the viewers. Uh, and it seemed to me also that the filmmaking process itself responded innovatively to the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, having worked myself on a project to document forest farming practices uh, in, in central Appalachia during the pandemic, I really love the way in which O Pioneer uses animation to illustrate stories told by the artists. And I wondered whether the animation was in fact a workaround for the conditions imposed by quarantine. Anyway, those are a few, few of the questions that I was thinking of and a few of the things that struck me and I'll hold other questions for later. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity to see the film and to offer some comments. Yeah. I will say, do Claire and Jonathan, do either of you want to respond to anything that, that Dr. Hufford mentioned, or do you want me to just keep going with questions? Yeah. Do you, Claire, why don't you start? I'll, I'll, why don't I speak to two and you speak to two, Jonathan, just because I don't want to take it for, for forever. But I love some of the verbs you're using, like residue, exile, uh, um, art. I didn't think you said generative, but like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm my mind, it's like firing lots of pistons. Um, but one thing that Jonathan has said before is how art is magic. And I don't mean this to be like uh, um, like whimsy, but I mean more like how it is regenerative, regenerative and it, it allows for us to heal quite often. Folk art, uh, you know, music, all different types of art. And like you said, the art of oratory skills that James has, um, the art of, of making um, fabrics, dyed fabrics and things like that. But yes, there was a lot of that uh, discussion and a lot of weaving of threads that you you picked up on in um, the edit and in the way we were careful to uh, not lead our subjects, but to let them, let, we were receiving from them a lot. And then we would be, um, when we noticed something like James speaking to the grandmother's bowl, we might go to Tim and be like, what do you remember about the past? And kind of lead in some ways, like, what is his, how is his art informed by the past, the present, and the future? And so that was, I hope that's helping out. But that's kind of some of the things that we did where we were creating, yes, but we are also letting our subjects and participants lead us. Go ahead, Jonathan. Mike, okay. I think I'm losing some of my service, so. Thank you for that. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I think that the part of a consequence of living in rural Appalachia is internet is not what it could be. And obviously I know there's efforts to improve that and I hope those uh, go through in a large way. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for all your comments and your thoughtful take on the film, Mary. I, uh, you know, a lot of it resonates with, with, conversations Clara and I was, were having when making the film. And I, I just, I want to perhaps deflect slightly and say that while there was a lot of thought put into how we did things, both 
before capturing and after capturing in the edit and in post, uh, so much credit goes to the participants in the film because like Clara said, we really went into this film um, trying to be as non-extractive as possible and as you know quiet and careful as we could. Um, and and in doing so, it really, it's amazing how you know all of the all of the participants say it. Um, but you know, I, I I reflect on on one time James said it where this idea of listening is is power. This idea of quiet has power, and um, really a s sort of thread in the film became, you know, the seeing the beauty and the strength in the ability to be quiet and to take our time and to be patient um, and, and mixing that with curiosity. And so really, ultimately the film became a practice, I think for Clara and I to, to do these things that we were learning from these amazing, you know, you know, artistic, you know, people. So I, I it's a long winded way of saying that I think we really got lucky, you know, we got so lucky to meet and connect with, you know, all of these talented people, we didn't, we didn't expect to have as much music in the film, for, for instance, we didn't expect to have uh, as much artistry outside of the, the, you know, like the, the words with James. And so a lot of like, even the art artistic, let's say, environments that we created uh, from scene to scene were in dialogue with the participants. And some of that even came from them of, oh, you know, why don't I do this? Or, you know, I'm going to be over here. And and just so it really was a partnership, you know, with all of these people. And we're just uh, rewarded uh, by their their generosity and uh, happen to be in the right place at the right time in, in many respects. Um, the, 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 I'll answer one other thing because you had mentioned the, about okay. animation. Oh, go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. No, go ahead. Um, the the animation, we always knew we were going to bring some animation into the film, uh, partially because we have a creative studio. It's a it's a muscle that we've honed over time. And, and why not? We, we love it and enjoy it. And we really love uh, what's called a hybrid documentaries. And uh, uh, these hybrid films weave traditional cinema verite with poetry visually, you know, or through animation and these types of things. And so it, it really allowed for an opportunity um, to, uh, you know, make these stories feel exponential or bring audiences more closely into a moment that they would otherwise not be able to, to be present. Um, so it was something that was uh, sort of preconceived, but the the pandemic did also heighten uh, perhaps a little bit of the usage that that we needed to employ because we couldn't get access to the hospital. We couldn't get access to certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, it was fabulous, really, really fabulously done. That 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 just oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for yeah, responding. I Absolutely. So I'm going to switch actually to, we have a couple of things in the Q&A box. So Perry Bennett has a couple of comments. He says, hi, Clara, the scene with James and the clocks being wound and ticking was a really artful way to employ his limited time or to imply his limited time due to health issues while also being able to tell part of his story. And then he also says he really enjoyed the interplay of the pioneering nature of these people while simultaneously photographing them in their home, surrounded by their life and things they made with them having made their life how they want like a pioneer. And so those are two very quality comments from Perry. Um, and then we have a question from Betsy. Uh, so she says, I have a question about the use of the metaphor of pioneer. I am not of indigenous background, but I wonder how this would have felt if I were. I love the idea of turning the Western myth of conquest and manifest destiny upside down, but can you get behind, beyond the horrors of genocide and conquest without moving through the negative connotations of pioneering a bit more? Yeah, so first I'm gonna, is is my internet holding up okay for right yes. now? Yes, yes. Um, Perry, thank you for your nice comments. And um, yes, the some of those moments like the ticking clock are kind of happy accidents. Like um, the, the Morleys, or I guess I'll call them the Morleys. It's really James Riggs and J James Morley. The Jameses, I should say, um, have numbers of clocks in their home. And 
uh, I feel like that is a part of them as characters. Like they are so aware of time and yet so um, not aware of time. It's really gorgeous. It's a really beautiful place that they sit. Um, they're very aware of the value of time. And like we've seen, you know, the notion of, of, of listening and things like that. So um, th that, that was editing genius on Jonathan's part. And yet also uh, a lovely, happy accident from the fact that these two people love their, their clocks. And, and that happened to be something that while James is reminiscing about his treatments, he, uh, his, his husband is uh, winding those clocks. Um, okay. Let's talk about manifest destiny, manifest destiny, um, and our indigenous, um, background, the indigenous backgrounds that are not, have not been respected in our country. Um, so, is the question is without moving into the negative connotations, can you speak to um, how a an, an indigenous person would feel about this? Is that what it, they're saying? I guess. But can you beyond beyond the horrors of genocide and conquest? I without... think I can I can say one quick thing, and then you can chime in, Clara. And, and okay. I would um, I just want to mention the the song usage that we had in the beginning. You, you can speak to that. So we want to, to be careful about this um, in in that we are not indigenous ourselves. And were we to tackle this, we would want to partner fully with indigenous filmmakers and storytellers to ensure that, uh, you know, the proper voice is, is coming through. That said, uh, what I will say in response is that, we, again, we were very aware of it. We were very aware of this and did want to put up as much of a mirror to ourselves as we as we could without, um, you know, uh, maybe accidentally uh, ostracizing our audience. And so we hopefully threaded the needle enough that it makes people ask questions and we want those questions to be raised. Um, but what I will say is my hope is that we don't forget these things, you know, moving on doesn't mean, you know, leaving a horrendous legacy behind. And, and, and it's, you know, it, it makes me think very much of what's going on right now across the United States in our schooling systems and in politics, uh, a, a desire to perhaps look away from what feels awkward to look at or scary to admit. Um, and so, again, the hope is just to put up a little bit of a mirror and then through the, the these, again, beautiful people uh, show that listening and being curious and having an openness to what may feel uncomfortable at times. So, you know, sometimes it's much harder to be quiet and listen in a conversation than to speak up and say whatever is on your mind. So our hope is that that uh, message comes through where these questions can arise and we can have very honest, intentional conversations um, with a willingness for, you know, our some of these darker historical, you know, realities to to live in front of us rather than completely behind us. Yeah, I, I'm going to speak to maybe the inspiration for the film because I think this will get at what maybe you're asking, Betsy. So when I first thought of the idea for this film, I literally was thinking about how my grandmother used to recite the poem Pioneers, Oh Pioneers by Walt Whitman. And I romanticized that film, that, that story and the pioneer, a traditional pioneer that you saw from the past. I was like, oh, it's so romantic. It's so cool. Like, yeah, let's go out on the trail and let's uh, set up a new set. Let's make settle a new village. Right. But you know what comes with that? A lot of heartache and a lot of brutality and the poem by Walt Whitman is it has verbs like grasping and uh, it doesn't say murder, but it definitely says things like it's going to be like, take what's yours. And uh, it's very violent. And when I went back to that poem, I was appalled and um, ashamed, if I'm honest, of the fact that I felt like what I thought was so romantic and, and endearing and, and um, inspiring was actually very hurtful. And whenever you see a whole generation or a whole community completely um, obliterated or thrown aside and put into on reserves, 
um, it's, 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 it is really very uh, saddening that you grew up with this mentality and this thought that was you thought was okay. And so this was my reckoning with what it what that meant to me, but also a reckoning for West Virginians. Like we are on soil that previously was not what was owned by native or I mean ownership was different. So but previously native people lived here and uh, and yet look what's happening on the same soil. Like I feel like the same, cycle continues. And for folks that live in West Virginia, we often feel very um, uh, extracted and ex exiled as well. And I don't mean to diminish uh, what happened to indigenous people, because I think that what has happened has never been righted. And um, I'm not sure that it ever will be in the United States, given our track record. But I damn well want to try and say like, hey, I see our faults and this poem, while I love Walt Whitman, has some faults and, and we need to judge it for its time. But then we also need to judge it for the time now. And, and we need to like start thinking about how to move forward in a positive way that hopefully lifts those indigenous voices. Now, this film is not made by indigenous filmmakers. Uh, and so I will clarify that I would not be able to speak to that, but I would love to hear from folks if they have something they'd like to share. Yeah, I'll, I'll add very quickly one, one thing to the, the song that opens the film. Again, a lot of the, the, the storytelling that we like is this sort of like, um, subtextual, you know, uh, not being too overt, you know, being overt enough that it sets seeds but you as a viewer are able to have the, you know, these thoughts and feelings grow, you know, as a participant rather than somebody that's being told. But in, in, with that in mind, the, the song that opens the film um, is by Polo and Pan and it remixes an old Iroquois song. And that Iroquois song was sung as women and children were leaving their land. And it's a very sad, very sad song. Mm -hmm. But here, when you hear it, it's fun and beautiful. And so that very much like having Kaya Cater play the banjo, very much like there are these contradictions with our historical past and the present that we wanted to, um, you know, have metaphorically and subtextually throughout the film. And the song is called Ani Kuni, A-N-I-K-U-N-I. Uh, it's sang a lot in Canada in school and in grade school, um, which is very fascinating. And uh, you should look it up. And a lot of children know the song from uh, from childhood onward. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for tackling what is often a very tough, tough um, topic. So Jennifer Taylor Eyed and has a comment where she said in the first round of comments about the film, no one emphasize one of the aspects that stood out most strongly for me, which is also something that stood out to me, which was that all three of your pioneers have an immense amount of engagement with their natural outdoor settings, whether it's the cloth drying on the line or James out in the woods with the preaching or the natural wooded setting of Tim's family home. And so um, that kind of leads into both the anonymous attendee question, as well as a question from my list, which is, um, are there other pioneers that you, you would invite us to discover that you weren't able to profile? And kind of also along with that, how did you land on the three pioneers that you landed on? Because they seem both related and yet also not related at all to each other in, as you go through the film. And so if you could speak to a little bit of any of that, that would be fantastic. Jonathan, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, thank you everyone for the questions. Uh, it's really appreciated. This is one of our most favored parts of the process is getting to connect and communicate with audiences. So thank you. Um, yeah. So before I jump into how we met, maybe Claire, you take that because you, you're, you're so good at it. I will say we definitely invite you to, to, to meet other pioneers and really the, the point of the film is that you are a pioneer. Like these three people, you know, there was there was not a traditional uh, sort of uh, pioneer identifier on on any of them from you know the sort of like 
cultural norms. You know, like none of these people were curing cancer or going to the moon or, you know, uh, redefining, you know, industry or anything of that nature. And so um, in many ways, what guided us to them was um, our desire to learn more. But my hope is that each and every one of you asks yourselves the question of whether you're a pioneer and hopefully now at least have a little bit more of an openness to consider or have confidence enough to know that you you are or you can be at any moment of the day and with anybody around you and to to get to know the people around you and and your neighbors all of the things that happen in this film were not preconceived you know everything everybody goes through just happened while we were filming with them and so the old adage of you know be kind to your neighbor because everyone's dealing with something is so true because I mean, we, we were with them for two to three years filming and, and you can see how much each of these people went through. So um, I'll just say, yes, I, I invite you to be curious and to have uh, interest in each other again, after a time period when I think, you know, the, with the pandemic and, you know, the, the sort of, uh, lexicon being used in the media and, uh, you know, politics, all of these sort of divisive, you know, um, words and, you know, forms of communication. I just, our hope is that it, it, it sort of, uh, releases you from a little, from that enough to be curious with each other. So I'll speak to a little bit of, um, the use of nature, and then I'll come back. I think I can circle back to how we've selected these particular pioneers. Um, parts of that were out of necessity due to the pandemic, as you can imagine. However, the majority of the reason we wanted to anchor ourselves to nature is that I have a very strong feeling, and as do the other filmmakers that helped mold this story, and I think all of our participants very strongly feel this way, that um, we have lost our connection to nature and our 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 soul is no longer um, tied and tethered to it in the ways that it should be. And this film was an attempt to bring back that quietness, which I kind of relate to nature. You can call it God, you can call it spiritualism, you can call it um, whatever. There are other words that I think you can relate to, to this thing without it being... Um, uber religious per se, but at the same time, it's something we've lost as society, I think. And some of that's technology and the speed at which we move and um, severe depressions and, and different uh, things that we're dealing with that distract us all the time from this, this na nature that's all around us and so um, healing and important. And it's really what is, is going to save us, right? And so bringing each of these people out into nature while it may have been needed because of illness and sickness and we didn't want to get each other sick it's just like the perfect cherry on top it is exactly what we all need needed at that time we needed to connect but in nature um and so that was very intentional the scene where james receives treatment in the woods completely intentional as if he's receiving treatment from the trees or from from the rhododendron path right um the the scenes where uh nelly sings her heart out inside her home that's just been obliterated by a fire but and yet nature comes into her home with beautiful flowers that she remembers when she was a child looking out her bedroom window and seeing those same flowers growing in the spring um, it's intentional. This is all like each one of these people has a very deep connection to earth. And, and if we go back to the indigenous and the manifest destiny, the indigenous people knew something that we don't know. We don't know that that is so critical, like putting your hands in the dirt is scientifically proven to heal you. And so these, this is why these three people, we got so lucky in that they all had this tether that um, not all of us have or I think all of us have it. It's just whether we uh, verbalize it and utilize it. And then the last thing I'll say is that we chose these three based on the verticals, but also the fat access. So we are a married couple with children and very busy. And so there is a limit on how far we can go within our county or region. 
these three people we happen to know, and they I wanted to figure out a way to study the pioneer of the past and the present and the future. And I thought, okay, well, what did pioneers do? The traditional pioneer, Western pioneer, uh, Caucasian or European Western pioneer was often a blacksmith, a seamstress, and they would set up a church. So there would be a minister or a chaplain. So there's your, that's how we selected these three. And they each had an aura or our gut said, these are the right people for this story. Thank you so much. So there's a question that is an anonymous question that I want to ask um, that all three of you are invited to respond to. Um, and then I see a couple other questions that are probably more for the filmmakers. Um, and then we'll open it up to anybody who wants to be elevated to panelists to ask their question in person may do that, or we can just keep going down the list of questions. Um, so the first, the anonymous question is, First, it's first a comment. It was, I struck by your individual stories as native and non-native West Virginians. How did your own experiences influence your choices to profile those whose families have lived in West Virginia for several generations, as well as those whose families arrived more recently? And then this is the piece that is maybe more for Mary. Um, is West Virginia culture defined, and more broadly, Appalachian culture defined by the first category, or is it being constantly reinvented by those who currently are living here? Okay, so my personal experience living in Helvetia growing up here had a huge impact on this. I mean, I don't I wouldn't have made this movie if I hadn't grown up in West Virginia and um, you know, seen what my family's experienced here and the way that uh, we have an enamor with a pioneering spirit and and um, uh, finding creative ways to to navigate hardship. Um, was very much a part of my upbringing. Um, if anyone knows where Helvetia is, it's an hour from anywhere on a very windy, narrow road. There's probably 50 or to 100 of us living here. And, and so it's it re requires a lot of resilience that, to live here. And um, that is something that I find across the entire state of West Virginia. There are pockets of beautiful communities and they are so important. And so we cannot lose those little rural communities. They're, they are the most valuable thing that we can offer the country um, in some way, in many ways. Um, and so there's a lot that you learn from the, the Bali sisters. These are the women that they they made quilts, they made homemade cheese, they lived off the land entirely, and they went to town one time a month, maybe, if that. Um, and so these types of things inspired me, and I uh, have a lot of love and empathy, but also I'm in awe of the people of West Virginia. And so I, I think that I can't say that I wouldn't have been, I don't think I would have made this movie if I'd grown up somewhere else. But Jonathan grew up somewhere else. <laughs> That's very true. Well, I want to invite Mary to speak if you're ready. If not, I, I can certainly answer. You're you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted, Mary. <laughs> yeah. I was excited when I found out you live in Helvetia because I live in Beverly. <laughs> not far from me. And not far. Maybe, maybe an hour. <laughs> As you say, it's an hour from anywhere, but yeah, no. Um, yeah, th this whole question, I mean, is there's this idea of the insider and the outsider and uh, which has been, as Emily Hilliard puts it in, in her recent book, um, Making Our Future, uh, she says it's been that that divide has been weaponized by the legislature and the government and so forth. I mean, in fact, when you, you find out that that if you I, we're, we're making a place here in uh, uh, we're, it's it's world. I see place making as world making. You you make you make your worlds with the people that you that are your neighbors, and uh, um, I I I think it's always going to be uh, changing. And um, yeah, is it defined? Is West Virginia culture defined by the first category? I mean, I think I think that was part of Emily's point. People are making culture with each other constantly and one of the uh, to, to um uh clara's uh, point um about nature and the the need for uh close yeah 
just close interaction and relationship with it. Uh, that conversations with people about the environment are, um, are are great bridges. They just bridge the gap, no matter who you know. Especially if you're if you're really interested in their stories and and in their experiences and and in sharing yours and so forth. Uh, you, you build worlds together. It's it's co composition. So, I, I, I don't know that West Virginia culture can be defined by either of those categories. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I guess it is being reinvented or reworlding. It's worlding and reworlding. Worlding. Yeah, I'm, and gonna, re-worlding. I'm gonna speak really quickly to a very specific example in Helvetia. We have a tradition called Fastnacht. It's a mm-hmm. fasting night. We burn old man winter and we scare away winter. It's a Swiss tradition mm-hmm. from Switzerland. And this is a Swiss town. And some people are like, oh, well, you can't change a tradition. It's tradition, right? But do you know what? Traditions are molded by humans and traditions have to be appropriate for those humans that celebrate that tradition and and also have meaning to those humans. So, for example, Fasnacht is something that we started doing again in the 60s and it was small and just for us kind of. Then Fallout 76 comes and features our little tradition in its, in its game that went across the globe. And now suddenly the whole world's in, interested in Fosnacht, partially due to that, but also it's also just, a, it's an enamor. It's a, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, interest in this weird thing that we do. And so we've had to transform our tradition and mold it and reinvent it. So it still is anchored to us in our identity, but is not destroying us. And I think that's one thing that I find very fascinating is how people get stuck in like culture has to stay the same. No, culture is mol- is molded and, and it's manipulated. It's just that we have a choice on whether we manipulate and mold it in the right or wrong way, or we manipulate and mold it in a way that works for us, but also is cognizant of our indigenous people, our children, our future, our planet. And so that's kind of what this film is attempting to do again. And Jonathan, I, you didn't get to speak to your outsiderness, but. I mean, I don't, I, I'll just add that. Uh, I mean, I've been dealing with this my whole life and it makes me think of identity and, and who gets to decide who or how you identify, you know, like for me, I, you know, like, Again, my parents are immigrants. I'm first generation American. That that in and itself has been something I've had to sort of share in order for people to know I'm Cuban, I'm Latino. And that's something I've had to say and share because it's not something that you just get from the external. And so I, I do feel like identity of place, of people sort of exists in the tension between the two. Um, and so I was going to say a very similar answer to you, Mary, of... Uh, it's both, you know, it, you, you can't kind of have one without the other. And it makes me think a lot of Helvetia, you know, Claire and I are very active there and we're in, you know, many of the committees that exist. And there is always this tension between the elders, the the history keepers and the youth and the energetic and inspired to find that balance. And and that's, again, I think that to me, at least, you know, like not to get Buddhist per se, you know, it's the middle way, but I often find myself thinking about that in, in these types of places. And I, I will say, I'm, yeah, yeah, born in Chicago, but feel welcome. And I, I feel I'm West Virginian. <laughs> Non-dualism. <laughs> not binary. Yeah. That's- I think that there, we're we're opening it up for panel for folks to pan, elevate themselves to panelists. Um, but I'm going to keep going down some questions. Uh, I think all three of you somehow combined to answer Jennifer Taylor Ed's comment in her comments, so that's really awesome. Um, so I'm going to actually ask a question from the list, knowing that all three of you, you may not see yourselves as working in community development, but all three of you work in community development through your uh, through your sector. So I've got a couple of questions around that. And then Perry and Russell both have some questions too. So I want to ask um, all of you, uh, particularly Clara has mentioned um, that you guys spend a lot of time with quiet, with, with folks listening and with really trying to hear the stories and that it's the quiet transformations that are are meaningful. And so I want to ask 
how do we create more quiet transform transformations and leadership opportunities in our own communities? Often we are in these small communities and the loudest voices are constantly in leadership roles. Well, how do we make space or create more moments for those quiet stories to come forward? And so all three of you can respond to that. So. Well, and I, I want to say that James Morley is is here in attendance too. So if any questions come up, I'm sure he would be very upset with me for putting him on the spot, but he's here. <laughs> I think we should put him on the spot for this question in particular. Welcome, Welcome James. <laughs> well, James, are you at a point where you're able to go off mute and speak? And if if not, you just stay muted for the next five seconds and, and we'll move on. There we go. Did I unmute? Yes. Yes. And I'm sorry, I, I can't get, wait a minute. I'm trying to get my camera activated. That might scare everybody off if that happened, though. <laughs> there you are. There you go. Hi. Oh, my. What kind of question now? <laughs> So they our our folks have spoken often tonight and kind of in community development world too about raising quiet voices. So how do you elevate the quiet leaders and the quiet voices of which you were profiled as one of them? But how do we who are doing all this work in our communities make sure that those voices are heard and those spaces are made for them when often it's the loudest voice in the room that takes up the most space? Is that question directed to me? All of you. <laughs> well, I, I can start it off. Well, if you all are thinking, I, I will say that I think um, what is often difficult about this, in, in my opinion, is that the those that have a place of power communally or in communities or even in organizations can can often um, easily miss uh, you know the the quieter folks and, and and I would argue oftentimes the the quieter people in the room are the ones who have the most power. It's just a an, an un um, externally sourced power, let's say, or you know like a non traditional or pop culture expected type of thing. So. Um, I do think that there is a bit of responsibility, uh, you know, in community leaders, in, uh, you know, company leaders, it kind of across the, the board um, to set scaffolding, uh, to to find these people, find these stories. And I know I'm speaking generally because I feel like it can it can act in many industries in many ways. Um, but you, you do have to work. You know, I think if you're in a, a position of power or let's say you're a community leader or what have you, you, you have to, you have to work and you have to search and you have to pave paths uh, as best as you can. So you can meet uh, these individuals where they are rather than expecting them to come to you. Cause it's, it's not going to happen. Um, and I will also just say very quickly, I think there is sort of like an existential side of this where I, I admire so much the, the quiet, the people who who can be quiet. And so if you can open yourself to seeing the strength in it, I think it might also uh, inspire you to find more of it and more people like it and, and to you know lift those voices. Thank you so much. You go. James is raising his hand, so go for it. My granny used to say about my cousin, Amber, James, watch out for the quiet ones. And um, I I think that uh, my religious tradition is too wordy. And if only we would have the balance of, of truly listening, whether it be a, an organization or a community or in a marriage or in a relationship. Um, and, but I also agree with Jonathan. Um, you can have great power um, in your in being quiet and in listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Hufford. Do you you look like you may have something to say? So yeah, well, I'm, I'm just thinking. I mean, as an, as a folklorist and ethnographer, yes, I, I'm I'm trained to, 
I trained. I mean, it's just been, it's the practice uh, to really seek out people whose voices are not being heard and to get outside of those public meetings and find places where you can, you can go and, and, and make contact um, with, with people who aren't, you know, as I always say, I, I break for bait shops, you know, you go, you go in and that's where you're going to learn something about the local fishing traditions and so forth. But, but, and from people who may not be attending the public meetings, but, um, but lots of places like that, you just start, start keeping an eye open for that. And, and, uh, and, and thinking about who's not, who who's not really part of the public or part of the leadership um, whose voices would be very important to listen to. You have to seek them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was going to add too, that it comes down to respect and um, sometimes the, if you don't, if you don't demonstrate that you respect hearing someone's voice, then it, change is not really going to happen. And so you have to let someone, even if let's say, someone in your community is complaining about something or has a very strange way of expressing how they want to create change or why they want to make this thing that they want to do. If you don't listen first and have respect for what their opinion is, how can you expect there to ever be change if you can't even hear them out and, and walk alongside them in their shoes and seeing where what they're struggling with? Uh, like a good example is, and this is very personal, I remember my sister dating somebody and I knew he was wrong for her. I was like, girl, you got to get out of this relationship, but you can't say that to somebody. They have to find it on their own. And the same is for community change and political change. We have to find this for ourselves and yet not destroy ourselves in the process, right? So we're kind of always buffering, up, teetering on this edge of like, how do we create change and protect ourselves and include voices uh, without, you know, and, and make change that is actually good for those quiet folks or and for the leaders and for the, the loudest person in the room. So I think respect is a huge part of it. And with listening comes respect. Nice. Thank you all so much. All right. So I'm going to ask Russell's question out loud um, for the filmmakers. It's please discuss the jerky cinematography. It drew him right in. So he was excited about it. So whether that was an intentional choice and how how all of that worked. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in very quickly with this one so others can have questions. But yeah, so I mean, a lot of the film was was um, captured handheld. Um, and so generally speaking, when you want to bring people into an environment and it feel personal, cinematographers will often choose to go handheld. Whereas if you don't and you want it to feel very sterile or very uh, clean or removed, you know, these types of things, it tends to be much more stable and, you know, using something like a dolly or a jib arm or a crane, things of that nature. So it was, um, both with that in mind, but also just resource wise, you know, like the, capturing a documentary, capturing verite, it doesn't lend itself very easily to uh, the traditional sort of Hollywood style of cinematography, where you might find very stable, slow moving camera moves, you know, you have to act quickly, you have to be nimble. And so oftentimes, Clara and I would be filming just one of us just two of us, camera, audio gear, you know, boom going, lavaliers packed to your right, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, it's just very run and gun, as they say in, in the industry. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope it, it wasn't too jerky, but yeah, it, uh, it was definitely a, a big part of the film to go handheld. All right, I want to recognize that it is two minutes till nine and we've had an amazing evening uh, with the panelists and with the film itself. So thank you all so much for participating. And to those of you that are the audience, thank you for sending and asking such thoughtful questions.